Hi everyone, welcome back to Lead Journey. Today we'll design a rate limiter. This is part of the system design interview series. Many tech companies ask system design questions as part of the recruitment process, so it's crucial to be able to ace this kind of interviews. Let's jump right into it. What is a rate limiter? A rate limiter is used to control the amount of input traffic received by a system from a client. When we talk about REST APIs, most of the time we want to implement some kind of rate limiting function in order to restrict the amount of requests a single client can send. If the number of API calls exceeds the limits, the requests will be blocked. Here are some limit examples. A social media app user cannot post more than 10 comments within 2 minutes. A user cannot upload more than 10 TikTok videos within an hour. A user cannot send more than 20 connection requests per minute on LinkedIn. I hope you get the gist of it. Let's look at some benefits of using a rate limiter. It prevents server overload. This prevents DDoS attacks by filtering out access requests by the same client. A rate limiter keeps costs contained. It's important to keep your endpoints under a rate limiter, especially if they're calling third-party APIs that charge for each request. Let's now jump into the actual system design exercise of the rate limiter. When starting the design of your system, you will want to identify functional and non-functional requirements of your system by asking questions to the interviewer. I have made an in-depth video about this topic, feel free to check it out. Here is a list of requirements for our rate limiter. We want an API rate limiter which is not on client side. The rate limiter must be able to handle a significant amount of requests. The rate limiter must support different rules for request throttling. Our system design will focus on a single data center. Users must get some feedback when the requests get throttled. System must provide low latency and low memory usage must be guaranteed. In our requirements gathering, we have concluded that we want the rate limiter to not be on the client side, but for it to be on the server side. Server side implementation gives us more control over our rate limiter and we can put it on our API servers. There is also another approach which has become quite popular because of the rise of cloud services such as AWS, Azure and GCP and that includes a cloud-based service called API Gateway which sits between the client and the API servers. The choice between a server-side in-house rate limiter or a cloud-based API Gateway depends on the requirements, budget and the current tech stack of the company. In this example, we'll focus on an API limiter that sits between the client and the API servers. This is also a good time to talk about rate limiting algorithms. Don't worry if you don't know any, that's why you are here and that's why it's good to practice these kind of questions. There are various rate limiting algorithms around and they all have different pros and cons and use cases. The one I'm going to show you today is the token bucket algorithm. This is a popular and simple algorithm used by big tech companies such as GitHub APIs and Google APIs to throttle incoming requests. The algorithm is based on the concept of a token bucket, which holds a fixed number of tokens. Tokens are added to the bucket at a constant rate and the requests are only allowed if there are available tokens in the bucket. Here's a simple overview of how the token bucket algorithm works. We first have token bucket initialization. A token bucket is created with a fixed capacity, representing the maximum number of tokens it can hold. The bucket is initially filled with a certain number of tokens. Then we have token addition. Tokens are added to the bucket at a constant rate over time. This rate determines the maximum rate at which events or requests can be processed. When a request or event occurs, the system checks if there are enough tokens in the bucket to fulfill the request. If there are sufficient tokens, the request is processed and the number of tokens equivalent to the cost of the request is removed from the bucket. If there are not enough tokens, the request is either delayed until tokens become available or rejected, depending on the specific implementation. Then we have token consumption. Tokens are consumed at the same rate they are added, ensuring a consistent flow. The other scenario is bucket overflow. If the bucket is full and tokens continue to be added, excess tokens are discarded. The token bucket algorithm provides a smooth and controlled way to limit the rate of events. 
preventing bursts of activity that could overwhelm the system. It is particularly useful for preventing abuse, managing traffic and ensuring fair resource utilization in various applications, such as network traffic shaping and API rate limiting. Let's now look at the high-level architecture of our system. Basically, we need a counter to keep track of the number of requests we get from the same client. If the counter is larger than the predefined limit, the request gets throttled. We could go for a SQL DB, but those might increase processing time as they are slow. So the best option in this case is to use an in-memory Redis store. Redis provides an atomic operation which we can use for our rate limiting, which is INCR. It increments the value of the key. And we also have an expiration command, expire, which sets a key's time to live in seconds. So this is how the high-level architecture should look like so far for our rate limiter. We can see that the client request reaches our rate limiter. We check Redis to make sure that the counter has not reached the rate limit. If it hasn't, the request is sent to the API servers. Otherwise, it is throttled and an HTTP 429 sent back to the client. In the system design we got so far, we do not have any information about where rate limiting rules are stored. We will require config files to store our rules and these files will be stored on a disk. Here is an example of how some rate limiting configurations might look like. In this HAProxy example, it limits the number of sessions to 10 requests per second for the API backend. In the second example, the Spring Cloud Gateway configuration limits requests to the API path using the request rate limiter filter. It allows 10 requests per second with a burst of up to 20 requests. One of the requirements for our system was to let the user know when the request gets throttled. And to do that, we can use the HTTP headers. Here are some common request headers associated with rate limiting. Limit. It indicates the maximum number of requests allowed in the current time window. Remaining. It indicates the number of requests remaining in the current time window. It decreases with each request. Reset. It indicates the time at which the current rate limit window will reset. This is often provided as a Unix timestamp or a formatted date time string. Reset after. It indicates the number of seconds until the rate limit resets. This is an alternative to reset and is often used for easier client-side calculations. Then we have window. It indicates the duration of the rate limit window, typically in seconds. For example, if the window is 60 seconds, it means the rate limit applies to requests made in the last minute. API providers may use a combination of these headers to communicate rate limit information to clients. Here is an example of what these headers might look like in an HTTP response. In this example, limit is set to 100, indicating that the client is allowed 100 requests in the current window. The remaining header is set to 50, indicating that the client has made 50 requests so far in the current window and has 50 requests remaining. Then we have reset. It provides the Unix timestamp when the rate limit window resets. Reset after indicates that the rate limit will reset after 300 seconds and in the end window specifies that the rate limit is based on a window of 3600 seconds which is one hour. This is the final design of our system. A request sent from a client is first intercepted by the rate limiter. The rate limiter retrieves the rules from a cache. It then checks in the in-memory ready store whether the limit has been reached or not. If the limit has been reached, the request gets throttled and an HTTP 429 sent to the client. Otherwise, the request is sent to the API servers for normal processing. At the end, the interviewer could ask you some follow-up questions which you will need to go over briefly explaining your approach. Here are some example questions you might get asked. How could you make this work in a distributed system? How would you make sure that your rate limiter is being effective? This was rate limiting at the application layer. Which other kind of limiting could you have implemented? I hope you found this video useful. Please leave any feedback or requests for future videos in the comment box below. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it somewhat useful to reach your goal. Please don't forget to like and subscribe as it allows me to keep creating more and better content for you, all completely free of charge. See you on the next video.